Interview, my name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today, I'm delighted to be joined from the Dallas, Texas area by Josh Ramsey. How are you doing, Josh? I'm doing great, John. How are you today? Yeah, doing great. Um, and uh, John, you uh, you had your own agency, agency since 2009, never looked back. Uh, you initially opened your own digital market agency with just a few dollars in your pocket and a car that broke down on the way to a conference. Um, acquired his first big agency client. Josh has been known for putting it all out there for himself and his clients. Fast forward today, after taking a short hiatus to enjoy retirement life. Uh, you're now an active speaker, author of the book, How Some, C uh, How Some SEO Companies Disguise Laziness and Hide, hide Poor Strategies. And you are back in the office each day helping others build their organization as a fractional chief marketing officer. And that's what we're going to talk today about is uh, how you can use a fractional CMO to, to improve your bottom line. So first, um, Josh, let's get straight into it. And for, for I mean, most people understand what a fractional resources, but just for those who maybe aren't 100% uh, clear on it, give us a definition of what a fractional CMO is. Yeah, so fractional CMO is going to be the in-between needing a higher level marketing expert uh, and putting them full-time on staff, which is going to demand a higher salary, uh, higher payment to that person, a lot of that would cost to a company. But to get there, a lot of times they don't uh, have that in-between point. They have a marketing director who doesn't necessarily have a lot of the expertise that they need. Uh, and then you have the executive that you want to hire, but a lot of times they can carry a heavy six all the way to a seven figure salary. Mm -hmm. So I'm that in between section to kind of jump you to that next level or maybe manage and build a better structure for your company. And then sometimes it's for startups, startups that are looking to polish their brand or put something better uh, out there on the front end are what's called a GTM go to market strategy. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's what a fractional CMO can do in short. Yeah. And I guess in, in order for fractional resources to be successful, uh, the, the company has to understand how best to utilize it. Correct. And exactly what they're, what they're getting and why. So when you, when you work with organizations, what kind of process do you go through in assessing like, are you the right fit? Is this fractional CMO the right fit for this company? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And everyone's a little bit different. You know, it's interesting because back in my younger career, I'd have people come to me after a conference and they'd say, my, my business is totally unique to anything you've ever known before. And I said, oh, okay, interesting. What is it? And they'd say, I'm a roofer or right. I'm, a, I'm a remodeler. And I would say, oh, okay, well, that's not very different. <laughs> they, never, they never could figure out what the unique selling position was. So we call that the USP. Mm -hmm. um, but there's different methods to marketing and different approaches and strategies. But a lot of times what we're trying to do is identify what it is that someone needs through a series of conversations, kind of like a business evaluation. A lot of times marketing reps or fractional CMOs will come in and have a 20-minute consultation and then they want to start billing you. My approach is a lot more of let me spend as much time as needed to really understand the depth of what is going on, what, what your history has been. And then I'm able to give educated decisions and direction on what should be done and why. I think that's a big difference for me anyway. And my unique selling position is to really spend the time to get to know somebody and know, am I the right personality? Do I have the right skill sets? Uh, and, and how do we move forward, you know, in the right direction? And then are we aligned? And that's right. where the business owner gets to make a decision of at a glance, this is what I see and what I would want to do and why. And then the business owner can take their, their knowledge along with that. And that's for myself, that's how I work, uh, and, and mm -hmm. like to work. Yeah, and I and I think one of the things is let's face it. I mean, business has gotten very complex. Marketing has gotten very complex. It's very easy to disappear down rabbit holes or to chase, you know, shiny objects. Or worse, is to put all your marketing on the wrong platforms or in the wrong places. Um, and as you said, I mean, if it's a startup or a company that's moving to another level or anything like that, um, the it's it's likely that they don't have that level of expertise inside or somebody who can say, listen, you need yeah, just push all that stuff aside. Here's where we need to focus. Yeah. I mean, the noise in the marketplace in general is really overwhelming to consumers. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
today I took a little break and I, I personally on my personal side don't spend a whole lot of time on social media for myself. Uh, it's very noisy. And today was the same thing where I took a little break to look up some of my family, my extended family's birthdays. And all I could see is the noise coming through. And a lot of consumers like that and they need that. They want that. That is a connection point. But that's what marketing is meant to be. The difference is all that noise. You have to know how to stand out from that noise. You have to be able to know what you want to say, why you want to say it. I work with a client right now and uh, and I use a methodology that some people know, but it's it's uh, the methodology of three steps. And these three steps are have something good to say, which is your inside reality and what makes you good. Then it's say it well, which is your messaging. And we call that strategic messaging. And then it's say it often is that third step. And saying it often is the tactical marketing, which is the placement of what you're trying to communicate. But we can't run around screaming from the top of our lungs. I'm the greatest out there. We have to be able to back it up. And that's where social proof comes in. And then you kind of go down a long line of, of education of how you want to communicate that. But again, everyone is unique. It's really the fact of how you pull that out of have something good to say. So yeah. it's the origin of who you are and what you're doing and why you're doing it. That's a, that's a key part there to understand. Yeah, because it's very easy, I mean, to get for, for companies to fall into some of these traps or a startup, maybe you get a bunch of money from a from a VC and next minute they're just dumping it all into Google AdWords or whatever, burning through cash like crazy and then wondering why they're not making the impact. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, I think, you know, your podcast a lot of times when I've heard it is talking about sales. And I think it's important also to understand the impact of good marketing can yeah. help sales, right? I'll use another quick, for instance, I'm working with, with someone right now and um, they have a sales team and they're really heavily focused on sales and the relationship driven. But the problem is, and again, it's not a massive problem, but it's more of a long scale, long term, something to be aware of and maybe start to resolve now so that you don't have it into the future. And that is the relationship building, right? That's what a CRM is, right? Client mm -hmm. relationship yep. management and using marketing the right way to keep that pipeline warm and keep those prospects aware of who you are while your sales team can focus on what's right there in front of them. Cause if they're yep. paid by commission, which a lot of people, salespeople are right then they want to close whatever's right there. But yeah. if you lose track of all of the leads that came in, the salespeople are just cherry picking, you know, on the best ones, but it can hurt the company in the long yeah. run if you don't have that cultivation. I like using the word maturation process. That's yeah. the term that I, that I likely to use. Yeah, yeah, no, because, uh, yeah, um, nurturing is kind of funny, funny term I always thought to use for, um, but on that, on that point that you just raised is the importance of the relationship with sales. So when you, as a fractional CMO, like, how do you, how do you optimize that relationship with sales from the get go? Because hopefully that's a legacy that you, you leave afterwards. Yeah, hundred percent. It is a legacy that you leave afterwards. And a lot of times companies don't find the value in marketing. I think it's because it hasn't been done right. They yeah. haven't been brought to the education level of what marketing really should be because mm -hmm. it is a brand. It is an interest. Yeah. It is mm -hmm. a, it is making you stand out in the crowd and then how you go about doing that. And the answer is there's not just one way to do it. A lot of times it's better to, to test multiple theories to be able to get there. Um, but you know, the, the marketing really should complement if they have a sales structure. Now, again, we're talking, I believe right now in the vacuum of you have a sales team or you are a yeah. sales person. It's about keeping that pipeline full, but also warm, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what a good marketing system should do is complement whatever the sales team or person is communicating, taking that message and then tailoring it so that way you, you get them on that buyer cycle and no matter where they're at from A to Z on that buyer's line, we're communicating the right message uh, through the maturation process to get them to that that next level of when it's time they pop up and the salesperson is, has already have primed them enough that they're ready to go and it feels seamless to the mm -hmm. consumer, the buyer. Yeah, I think another another part of this is too is that uh, 
I think sometimes, I mean, we know that age old thing, sales don't really understand what marketing does. And a lot of people don't, to be perfectly honest. A lot of people think marketing, oh, that's the fun stuff. You get to paint pretty pictures and send out emails about websites and all of that. And they don't realize how complex marketing has gotten. I mean, take something even uh, like SEO, right? I mean, you need real expertise in SEO and because they love to do this stuff, they'll change an algorithm and then you got to relearn or they'll move analytics to Google Analytics. for. And I think that's part of the problem is people don't understand that a lot of marketing work is not the fun, pretty stuff that you see. It's down in the weeds, tactical stuff doing every day and needing the expertise and understanding to be able to do it well. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you bring up some good points there, and, and that's when we go, how much time do we have to talk about? <laughs> I mean, but here, here's what I would just carry forward with what you said is, you know, you could think algorithms, you can think fun and pretty, but when I break it down and I speak at conferences, one of the things that I spend quite a bit of time to talking on is there are actually more than one mind when it comes to marketing. And like mm. you said, when you used it, you kind of use two brains. You use one brain of pretty and fluffy. So we call that design, right? Okay. Designers. And if you think about the type of person that does design, how do they live? How do they think? What do they enjoy doing for fun? But then you think about the code, the SEO, how to apply it, what a website does in the functionality. And if you think about that person as a coder, think about how they like to live, what they enjoy doing and, and the environment that they like to live in. These are two very different personalities, right? They're not the same. And the first part you have to understand in marketing is what is it that you're trying to achieve? And mm -hmm. oftentimes this is where people miss the bus is that they hire just a designer or just a coder to achieve the greatest uh, equation that they're trying to, 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 to solve, the, the biggest problem they're trying to solve. Mm -hmm. And that is get someone to communicate, get that yeah. first touch point. That's where that third brain comes in. And I consider it the biggest part because that is the strategist. What is the strategist going to take and understand what the consumer wants and needs? How do we make it UI, UI user interface, the visual, and the UX, the user experience? And how do we analyze both of those to bring it together to make the best process to, again, support the sales team? Because marketing at times can just sell, right? You go to Amazon, you yep. don't need a sales team. You just need a good UI UX, right? A good description and you're pretty much done. But if you're trying to sell something other than a gadget, so to speak on Amazon, then you do need a little bit more marketing power behind that to get that name out there. So again, I'm, I'm kind of trying to keep it short for this interview, yeah. but, but that's, that's one thing to really consider is, is all of that information on top of what you say. Yeah. And that's why I love this idea of the marketing generalist, because I'm like, marketing generalist, who who even is that? Because as you said right now, like somebody who's going to be really good at SEO is probably not going to be a great designer and yeah. vice versa. And so this, uh, and, and I think things have become so, I think a lot of these roles have become so specific now is that you, um, it's, it's impossible to have all those skills in the company. And it's also the fact is that sometimes you're going to need that skill set for a period of time or for a project or maybe yeah. just for a few hours every so often. So I think the use of fractional and variable resources, I think that's the, to be honest, I, that's the future. It, yeah. well, it's the present for some, but, but it's the future too. But you know, I mean, even on that, I, I listen and study a lot of information. And one of the things that I'm seeing from even other top level speakers are they're saying that uh, agencies need to be focused more on even hiring fractional CMOs for an advertising agency oh. because they have designers and they have coders and they have project managers who manage those, but they don't have the visionary. And yeah. that's what a fractional CMO really does bring is the leadership of what needs to happen, not just the execution, right? Someone has to lay that roadmap. Um, someone has to drive the car, but someone has to give that roadmap of this is where we need to go and why. And then here are the KPIs, those key point indicators to know this is why we're going to go that direction. So I think that that's, you know, again, it's a lot of information to kind of take in, even in this short interview, mm -hmm. but it is part of what the fractional CMO world is all about. And there's, there's really not that many fractional CMOs out there that know what they're doing. And the other thing that I'll, I'll point to, so I'll give two little tips here to anyone yep. watching this. And one of them is 
when you interview an agency and you're thinking about hiring a marketing agency, find out from them who does what in the role, like as in who would you work with? And then identify and interview each of those people to know what their personality is. Are mm -hmm. they a designer? Are they a strategist? Or are they a coder? And be, be weary if you hire somebody or you're looking to hire someone that's both the designer and the coder. Yep. Because like we just talked about, those mm -hmm. are two different skill sets, right? Um, but then finding out that strategist part is a, is a really important part to really know what it is that that strategist is going to do and what their approach would be with your product. I personally look at uh, testimonials to a degree to be able to say, have they done this industry or not? But if you think about it, the biggest companies, when they go hire a new CMO, they don't hire from within their industry. They hire from outside their industry because that new blood brings something fresh and a new perspective into it. And I think that that's another big miss that I was going to point out to people is, you know, don't be afraid to venture outside, but yeah. look at their skill sets, not just where they came from. Right. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think I'm glad you, you really emphasize the strategic and the strategy piece. Cause I think that's so key. And, and it's actually my favorite quote. Cause I was looking up again there from, from the art of war from Sun Tzu, it's strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. <laughs> yeah. And I and I love that because, you know, I mean, obviously strategy has to have time, you have to execute. But if you're executing without the strategy without the strategy, then you are. It's the noise before defeat. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean that nailed it, right? I mean yeah. that said it better than anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I guess that's uh, and 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 I think that's interesting. What you say now is when you're looking at at agencies and stuff to assess the skill sets of the people who are going to be behind behind um, that. And here's, of course, you know, we love wildcards, don't we? So now we have AI coming in here, and of course, like people are suddenly there's all these tools flying around, like oh, you know, you don't have to, you, I don't have to get anybody anymore. AI is going to do it all for me, and so. I think there again, it's going to be very critical that you're working with the right people strategically to understand how to apply these and people who can cut through the, again, cut through the noise and the hype and everything and get down to the reality. You know, I'll, I'll speak to AI, but I'll, I'll take you through a quick little journey. I don't know if you've ever paid attention because here we are right now in 2023. And if you remember earlier in 2023, a video went viral and it was a, it was a younger child that was singing a song about uh, thank you for sunshine, thank you for rain. And it turned out while it went viral in 2023, it was actually recorded seven years previous. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden it goes viral because one or two people had never heard it before, they start posting it and off it goes. Well, if you look at AI, AI has actually been around more than just the last six to 12 months, like <laughs> everyone thinks. And if you think about that and you want to kind of question that, if you're whoever's watching this, just go look at what autocorrect is, auto spell, spell check in your Word document, right? Um, your phones, there's just so many things of what AI has been, and it's just been brought to an easier level. Mm -hmm. But I loved uh, a speaker that I heard a couple of months ago, it was about a year ago, I guess, and they said, AI is not here to replace anybody, but if you don't know how to use it properly, then it is going to replace you. Right. So it's one of these things that I tell people, they ask me, hey, I can have AI write me a blog. I said, mm -hmm. yeah, you can. Yeah. But now here's the next question you have to really think about. Number one, if you plagiarize a blog because you and your closest competitor both had the same idea on the same topic and went to the same bot, you've now plagiarized each other. Google scores you negative for that. Yeah. So now the next part is, and I'm going to move pretty quick through this, did it really SEO friendly your website? Did it use the right keywords, the right mm -hmm. terminology? Then the next part is, so this is level three, who's going to put it on your website? Now that's not AI. Now you have to actually have a person that knows how to do some type of code to take that script and put it on the website. Mm -hmm. Then they have to index it. Then they have to submit it to Google to get it indexed by Google or whatever other search engine you want to use. So there's multiple steps. The easy part would be to get the ideas, and I use AI to get sure. ideas, but then that, I keep going back to the term, not to overuse it, <laughs> but the maturation process is a maturity process. You know, I watched something the other day and this guy interviewed and, and they said, you've had this job for 10 years. Why should you keep it for another, another five? And he's, his response was, 
it's it's like the last 10 years has been like having a baby but you still have to mature the baby you still have to protect the baby you still have to teach the baby and you still have to help the baby grow up and feed mm -hmm. it that's the same thing with ai it's it's going to be evolving and grow but who's going to take care of it who's going to feed it who's going to nurture it and how are you going to guide it to make your life better that mm -hmm. part is still going to be human based and psychology based yeah, no, I, I 100% agree with you. And I think, uh, unfortunately, a lot of people are going to get caught out because like you said, is um, Google doesn't like that. Google doesn't even like doesn't like the even if nobody else posted that they don't like you that you used AI anyway. So um, it, it's, uh, it's, it's going to be it, it's going to be extremely interesting. And I think it was, I think it was even Steve Jobs way back when who said like, AI, he, he likened AI in the future to a bicycle. He said, it'll help you get to where you're going quicker, but it won't go there on its own. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Mm. Well, listen, Josh, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. All of Josh's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, so again, I'm a fractional CMO, uh, and I, I really specialize in helping people is the way I focus uh, my world. I believe, just like Google does, that the best the best thing we can do is we can actually go out and help people and if we help them then we create a good environment around us and more people want to be involved with us so that's really my focus is just doing the best i can to help each person that i run across and help them solve their problems and get them to that next level and if i do a good job doing that I feel like more and more people are going to want to work with me. So that's yeah. my goal. Hey, there you go. It's a simple concept, but hey, simple doesn't always equate to easy. <laughs> but great stuff. Thanks, uh, Josh. Thank you for listening and watching, and I will see you all again very soon. Thank you. Yeah.